Welcome to a video on the Dodge Hornet. In this video, we're going to dissect Dodge as a brand and what it's like to have your identity stripped from you. Now that they have to forego the V8 era of vehicles, it would be like asking Al Capone not to be Al Capone. So what do you do? Your bread and butter is gone. What people know you for is gone. And now we're left with this and probably a few other products that are going to be attempting to do something different. The Dodge Hornet is a CUV that they've taken an architecture that is very old and tried to create something new out of it. And the angle that they're going for is fun and fast, okay? In this, I'm going to talk a little bit more seriously about it, and Jack is as well. And when you look at it, most people just see the proportions, they're like, it's not so bad. It is a very smooth looking appearance. It's not shouty. It is also not overstyled. This harkens back to some of the older Dodge products that may have been a little bit more cohesively designed on the outside and the inside. And I'd say because of the Stellantis connection, they have access to more resources and part sharing. So what you've done here is this seems much better than what they used to do. Namely, when you compare it to something like the Compass or their commodity Jeep vehicles, the interior of this car looks, and I'm not, I'm just gonna say it, it looks like somebody studied Audi interiors. The way that the whole center console is, the switch gear for the HVAC, the door panels, there's a lot of like European influence in here. And in some cases it works quite well. It looks more upscale for what it is. And granted, this is gonna be pushing, you know, $40,000 in most cases, but of course there's gonna be a lot of incentives on this. Um, it is one of the better Dodge interiors from a quality perspective, but you know, they've typically been behind in that game. So it's really good to see that they're making effort. They know that this is very important. Now, is it going to be important to the Dodge enthusiasts, the people that have gone to Dodge in the past? And that's something that they're going to find out very soon. Seat wise, great seats. The usability and ergonomics is really good. The storage is pretty decent overall, and the way that everything is laid out is easy to use. Back seat room is about average for this class, and so is the cargo capacity. With the seats up, it's clear that you're going to struggle putting things in the back, and I, I noticed this right away, I'm like, it's not all that different from like a larger sedan. Uh, it's certainly not going to be class leading. If you're looking for pure cargo capacity, you're gonna go to a more traditional like CUV SUV. Everything else in here in terms of infotainment and technology is a little bit more sorted out uh, compared to some of the other brands that are in this price range. The infotainment seems slow. This seems to operate pretty well, but there is more crashes. It, it does glitch out and get slow once in a while, but it is pretty quick to boot up. Phones pair quickly. Uh, in terms of tech, in terms of the electronic gauge cluster, I noticed that the frontal crash mitigation system is always canceling itself out and erroring out. It's something that we definitely noticed. The horn also doesn't work, which is probably indicative of this car being serviced and maybe having the wheel removed and not reconnected. So God knows what's been going on with this car in the background. So I don't want to judge everything just on face value. But this is one of their better interior jobs, it's one of their better layouts, and it's one of their more cohesive designs. Whether that's completely a Dodge thing, or really their, their shared resources is another matter. But Jack's going to tell you about the technical attributes of this car in the shop. In the shop with the Dodge Hornet RT. Now as Mark mentioned in the beginning of this video, this is a very important product for Dodge because it represents Dodge's next chapter a chapter in which Dodge has to figure out what they are in a post-Hellcat world. They can no longer rest on their laurels of being that muscle car manufacturer. They have to prove to their customers that Dodge is still a viable option. And to be honest, they are leaning into what Dodge used to mean for a lot of people, sporty, somewhat inexpensive fun. So the Hornet specifically is a small non-premium CUV which competes in a very, very competitive class. Vehicles like the CRV, which is excellent, the RAV4, which will outlive you and I, the CX-5, which is great, and about a billion other SUVs, is this class the Hornet is thrusted into. And what they're trying to do as an organization, Dodge that is, is build the sportiest non-premium CUV, which is an interesting sort of niche to put yourself in. So the Hornet GT, which is the base model, this car comes with essentially two trim levels, the GT and the RT, the GT, with its four cylinders, apparently 
the most powerful, non-premium, quickest CUV for around $31,000. It's good for zero to 60, about six and a half seconds. Now, moving past that, what is this car from a technical perspective? Well, it has a mechanical clone. That is the Alfa Romeo Tonali. It is a vehicle that is on the small, wide Fiat Stellantis platform. It is their long wheelbase variant, which also underpins the Jeep Compass. This is a very, very old architecture, which traces its roots back to the early 2000s with a small Fiat SUV. Obviously, it's been massaged and changed over the decades it's been around, but that's what you're working with. From a suspension perspective, it is strut front and strut rear. It is the only SUV I think I've ever been under with that configuration. It is a Chapman three link in the back and it is a McPherson strut front. The cars or the trim levels, the GT and the RT, both come with Kony FSD passive dampers as standard. When you option in the track package, this is not a track car, this is their sport pack, the base car and the RT both now get Morelli dampers. They're a adaptive damper that has regular and sport, what's good for slightly better body control and a sportier feel. The cars, the GT and the RT, both have different uh, steering ratios. The RT is a little bit quicker, the GT is a little bit slower. Both cars come with brake by wire as standard. The RT gets four pot Brembos. And when you put the track pack on the GT, it then uprates their smaller brakes to these four pots. The nice thing to note about this, this architecture as well is the weight balance is actually pretty decent. It's like 52, 54% front, and it's relatively nimble feeling. Fairly well covered up, particularly when you compare it to the Jeep Compass, and just like the Alfa Romeo Tonale, the lift points are covered up with these access panels, which I guarantee you, you're gonna break off the fourth or fifth time you go and uh, try to lift this car up. It has little push pins that do not actually have a screw head, so you actually have to get in there with a panel popper, and I can guarantee you that when you take this to a Dodge dealer in three years, every one of these things is gonna be broken off. Now, let's talk about drivetrains. The GT and the RT are the two vehicles. The GT is 31-ish thousand dollars, the RT is in the low 40s. The GT trim level, which we're not underneath, gets the Hurricane four-cylinder, two-liter turbocharged engine. It's good for about 268 horsepower and 295 foot-pounds of torque. That is on premium gas. Its combined fuel economy is about 24, and it has a on-demand traditional all-wheel drive system. It is a lighter car. It has a curb weight around 3,700 pounds, and it has torque vectoring by brake. That's how they simulate a limited slip differential. I have not driven that car, and it puts its power down through a nine-speed automatic. It is the ZF gearbox. It's not great, it's not terrible, but it's a tried and true drivetrain. Now the RTs come with the identical mechanical drivetrain out of the US spec toenail. It is a 1.3 liter turbocharged four cylinder engine combined with E all wheel drive, an electric motor and the rear axle and a small battery pack. The E motor in the back produces 188 foot pounds of torque. So total system output is actually higher than the Tonali, and that's purely down to software. And this vehicle has sh hot shot mode, basically boost mode. You pull both paddles, you get an extra 15 horsepower. This vehicle is allegedly good for zero to 60 in the mid fives when you put it in boost mode and you get a good launch. The main thing is it is heavier than the base car or the GT. The battery pack, which is 15.5 kilowatt hours, it's about 273 pounds. It's in the rear of this vehicle right below the trunk. It compromises trunk space a little bit by about five cubic feet. It's 273 pound weight delta just in the battery pack alone. It's a lithium ion pack. The car has an E range of about 30-ish miles. I haven't gotten that, but it is very, very cold in Illinois right now. Past that though, let's go take this for a quick drive and walk you through what it's like to live with. <laughs> Power shot mode, Mark. Yeah, it's time for power shot, Jack. You actually have to shift in this car. It'll let yeah. you ride redline. That's pretty crazy for something like this. But then again, I mean, it makes sense if you're trying to make some type of performance thing. So, Jack, you spent a lot of time, a lot of time doing research on this car because nobody's really talking about what it is or it's not. And we kind of joked around about the Tonali to the point of the video really doesn't offer much. So here it is, you want information, you got it. Let's talk about it. All right, let's talk about ride quality. We're in sport mode right now. It is 
basically a little stiff. It's not terrible. The car's got reasonable body control for what it is being a tall CUV in regular mode. The Morelli dampers, this has the track pack, rides pretty well. I think, you know, given the class of car that it is, it's not bad. And I think my takeaway from this is, you know, you have the MSRP and then you have the actual real price of this vehicle. The real price, this is not a RT plus, just a regular RT with a performance package. You're getting these things for the low 40s, really high 30s. And what it's offering you is a little bit more dynamic of a driving experience than something like a CRV and way more involving to drive than a RAV4. Yeah. It is substantially quicker at zero to 60 in the mid fives and it, it feels like it feels like that, I guess. And you have the PHEV factor of this vehicle. You're getting 20 miles or 25 miles, maybe 30 if you're lucky, of E-range. And for $40,000, I can't think of another small SUV that offers those factors. Is it a remarkable driving experience? No. But to be fair, none of these cars in this class are. They have, in some ways, delivered on what they're trying to offer in this segment, which is a plug-in hybrid mm -hmm. that is quick in a straight line and is not entirely, like, fall asleep to drive. And so what do you think about the rest of the vehicle, things like the steering, the transmission, the brakes, all that other fun stuff? I mean, to me, it feels like a, a tarted-up Jeep Compass, it, you know, in a lot of ways, right? Like, it's quieter. Uh, the damping's way better. The steering is better. Uh, it's way more responsive, obviously, because we're dealing with more power from the plug-in hybrid. It, it's it's taking that platform and trying to, to refine it to the point of it's kind of bordering on the entry-level luxury thing for a CUV. So it's not. It doesn't feel is like an like an economy CUV as much. It's definitely quick. It's quiet. It's pretty refined overall. Um, the the hybrid powertrain part of this isn't is completely smooth, and this is something I noticed on all all of these types of vehicles. Is there's a lot of lugging of the engine to get you up to the highest gear, so it it always feels like it's uh, just chugging to to get you up to the highest gear for fuel efficiency. But other than that, to, to be completely fair to this, from what it is underneath to what they've made it into is quite refined it's way more refined than i expected for this price point if you compare this to some of the older dodge commodity suvs like the journeys and the compass and the god the caliber this is on another planet does it make it a great suv in this class this is a hard one and i think you know before we get too much into the philosophy, I guess the last thing I'm going to ask you, gearbox and brakes, how do they feel? So the, it's it's interesting just driving this hard because the brake pedal is obviously, it's a load cell. It's so a brake, it's brake by wire. Brake yeah. by wire. So you got like two inches of travel where the sensor's picking up and everything else is just spring loaded. Like it does nothing after a certain point. The other thing I noticed, like I was just screwing around in the roundabout and I noticed this a little bit more, but this confirms it. It will not let you go any faster like normal stability control lets you get power and then it cuts it on and off cuts it on and off to like give you a little bit here and there this just literally will not go down a gear it will not kick down and it will not allow you to reach past a certain level of lateral g so instead of just bouncing off the stability control and brakes it's like okay i know the g-force that you're at i'm not going to give you any more power to get around the corner it's an interesting implementation clearly if you're buying this you know, it's got, it's it's all marketing. Almost all the performance stuff here is just marketing nonsense. Nobody's buying this to, to go to a track or whatever. So it, it's like this strange in-between for me of, okay, you got some of the performance things you want from a CUV that's mostly faux. It's just BS. To, yeah. To get you into this car. Yeah. And I think that, all right, that's going to lead me back into the philosophical part. And we had a long discussion, you know, before, you know, before this drive about what Dodge is and I sort of alluded to it in the shop. Let me say one thing yeah. before you say that. You know, I grew up with Dodge products, right? I, my mom had a LeBaron. I had a Sundance. I had a lot of these horrible generation Chrysler product cars, right? And then, you know, 
the first car that they had made that really impressed a lot of people was the Neon. Like, when I drove the Neon RT and some of these, like, earlier Neons that were great for a small car, it was the first time we had seen an American car manufacturer kind of get it right. And it was the era where it could be good, right? They were ultra lightweight. They were engaging to drive. And then all the American brands seemed to just stop caring about them. I don't know if it was just internal philosophy or what it was, but they all moved towards bigger vehicles, trucks. And one of the things that this brand, it, one of their failings is they're so far behind because all the other brands have kept their cars around and developed the small car platform. Toyota with Corolla and Camry scaling it out. Honda with Civic and Accord scaling it out. VW with the Golf and all the smaller iterations scaling those out to bigger vehicles. Um, and this company, what they did was they kept Belvedere alive, the Belvedere assembly plant, to put some of their worst small cars in it. And they never evolved it out. So now they're so behind the eight balls. The Koreans have, are far more advanced. The Germans are better. The Japanese are better. And pretty much everybody else, aside from the American brands, have figured out how to do this. Even Mazda is way better than this. So it leads me to the question to you, aside from the marketing, why would you even consider buying this? over basically what everybody else has figured out doing way before them. It's the price and the PHEV factor and the fact that you want to have a little 1% of fun versus something like a RAV4. Is it really fun though? You and I are so broken internally of what fun is and what isn't. If you're coming out of like an old Compass or an yeah. old CRV or an old RAV4 and you get into this thing, you'd be blown away by the performance. If you're coming from an American car yeah. thing, American small CRV, like an Equinox, this is, this is like next level. Yeah. But if you're if you're used to some of what the other brands have done, this this to me, other than going fast in a straight line, I, I and the plug-in hybrid, the part. plug-in hybrid part of it, uh, under warranty, of yes, course, yes, under warranty. What else? What else do you have? I, I, and I, I don't know, and I think that's the question Dodge has to answer, and that's getting back to my the point, is Dodge is now a different brand. I mean, they can't rest on their laurels of being a muscle car brand. The thing that Dodge yeah. had going for them for a very long time is when you thought of Dodge, you got a regular person to think about Dodge. Jokes aside, yeah. you thought about a Hellcat going sideways, right. and that noise, and the fact that they are the muscle car manufacturer. For better or for worse, they're the brand that makes, like, you jokingly call them, like, uh, meathead masterpieces, right? Yeah, right. They can't do that anymore. So they are trying to reinvent themselves in a world where they don't have the 6.2 liter with a blower. They have right. to work with four cylinders, hybrids, PHEVs, and EVs to, to rebuild their brand identity and what are they going to do and how are they going to manage that. And I think... They're going to have to figure out how they make sporty, whimsical cars using those drivetrains and whether or not their buyers, and their buyers are a fickle bunch of people, right? They are diehard Dodge people are going to accept this new way of thinking. Yeah, and, and to, to be fair to them, I do not envy that position because, let's to, to your point, they're known for brash, loud, emotional cars. And it's like taking, it's like saying, you are known for being a big metal band and then all of a sudden you can't play metal anymore and you move over to soft rock you know it's it's like you can't do what you're good at anymore so now what do you do how do you evolve yourself yeah and i i don't know i don't know how they're going to do it honestly because everybody's going to be doing evs and plug-in hybrids like sooner rather than later aside from putting speakers on the outside and making the things just obliterate their tires i, I you know I don't know how they catch up, and I, I would not want to be in that position. And I may, it makes sense why the marketing is so uh, vicious with this, like so ridiculous, because they're trying to, to do it on the marketing side. And I, I don't know. Do, are people going to buy into it? I don't know, and I think that's something this brain is going to have to work on. That they, For them to survive, right, the Challenger and the Charger, as of making this video now, are, are dead. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, the Dodge now has what, two products, the Durango and this thing. All right. And you know, Chrysler has one car. Yeah. The, the Pacifica and I, you know, Ram is great. They've been around for forever, and Jeep is still competitive. But Dodge as a brand now has to figure out what do they want to be yeah. and how do they compete? You know, behind being behind the eight ball with everybody else. Yeah. So, with that, Mark, let's head into the final thoughts where you can summarize the pros and the cons of the Dodge world. Sounds good. Well, if you made it all the way to the end, it looks like you just got stung by the Dodge Hornet. The clear takeaway is 
this brand is really trying. You can tell with this car, they did everything they could with what they, with the resources they had. And it's gonna be interesting to see what direction they take, not only from the marketing side, but the, the product quality side. So the interior clearly is a step up uh, and you can thank probably multiple resources for making that happen. And they're taking something that they've had for a long time and trying to make it continually evolving and make it better. The question is, is this, even with the discounts, going to be enough for people to buy this for the long term? Because this is not a luxury product, right? This is not a lease vehicle where you're like, okay, I'm gonna lease it and then get rid of it. This isn't the price point where people are buying real commodity cars like CRV, RAV4s, Crosstrex, all of that where they're gonna buy it to keep it. So this notion of very complicated hybrid system, plug-in hybrid system at this point, so there's gotta be some reason why they can get it down to this, this price. Is it gonna be reliable? What's the resale value gonna be? What's the cost to repair? What's the dealer network like? I think this is where people don't have a ton of money to spend or don't want to spend a ton of money on something and they just want to drive it and never think about it long term. So again, we're going to have to see where this goes, just like the Tenali. Um, overall, it is good as a new product. It drives great. You know, you have the electric range part of it. Uh, the handling's good. Some of the things they've integrated into it in the interior are pretty well done. So uh, time will tell and that's where I'm going to leave it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.